Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show once again. With me are two UAE men national cricket team players. Yes, the captain leading from the front, Ahmed Reza, and our star batsman, Chirag Suri. Hello, guys. Hey, Jitrali. Thanks for having us again. Great. Hi, Thank you very much. Today, we have two special guests on board, the two dynamic and influential leaders. So let's welcome our national development manager, Mr. Andrew Russell. Hello, Andy. How are you doing? Yes, that's what we oh, thought. Well, How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. Alongside, we have selector and head of National Academy program, Mr. Mudasar Nasser. Mr. Modi, how are you doing? I'm good. Good. That's what we, we call him, yeah? Uh, not that he has any mood swings, but uh, I think he feels a little young when we call him Modi. I am young. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes, guys, so let's get started. If you want me to yeah, go so first, I'll, I'll go just ahead. jump. I think, no, no, no. Um, obviously, UAE has been um, home to a lot of cricket recently. I think um, the credit definitely goes to um, the board, uh, you know, for hosting tournaments. You know, we've seen countries not being able to host our tournaments, you know, because of, obviously, COVID reasons and different other reasons. But you know, cricket coming to the UA is always exciting for us as players. And I think it, it benefits all of us from it. I think, you know, recently concluded ESL as well. I think it was an amazing event, you know, especially in these circumstances. But, you know, obviously very, very hot at the time. But, you know, just they ended, they ended up re really pulling through. And, um, you know, a lot of UAE cricketers also getting opportunities. So, I think... Uh, it, it is benefiting the country as a whole. And um, I think it's, uh, you know, we're going towards the right direction. Summertime traditionally in the UAE is a, a quieter time. But what we've noticed domestically, at least, is there is a lot of tournaments happening. So people are obviously staying, staying here. They're looking for things to do and cricket being the best pastime there is. They are playing day and night. So it's good to see the, the season continues all around the year. So as the next season, which generally starts in September, is going to be almost the back end of the previous season. So it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of plays out. Yeah, um, and it, if you look at uh, what is happening in UAE now, it's flooded with cricket. When you look at what has happened with the Pakistan cricket team, you know, making it to their second home a few years ago and then continuing to play and PSL taking place and IPL. And you only have to look at all the infrastructure which has developed in the past uh, 10 years. In the past, you know, when, when I was playing cricket, there were about three to four grounds and you had to make do with those grounds. But now, there is so much cricket happening. As you know, the, you said yourself, there's 35 established uh, academies in, all over UAE. And look at the number of people playing cricket. And when I first started working for the ICC Cricket Academy, we could only function, we were told, in April. Schools would play their cricket only in April, and that was the only slot available. And by the time, in the next two, three years, as we started to develop cricket uh, at the ICC, all of a sudden it became 12 months a year cricket. Although, you know, in the past, Sharjah always had 12 months a year cricket. But the other Emirates weren't as busy as uh, Shahjava. And I mean, obviously, Madhya, the demand is, has hugely gone up even since I've been involved with Emirates Cricket Board. I, I remember when I came on board about five or six years ago, we had 26 uh, turf grounds. We five years later and we've got 48 and it's still growing. So it's an amazing growth we've seen. And it's, it's all, I think it's, it's coming from the demand. So there's a huge demand for, for play. There's a huge demand for matches. I know Matt, some grounds are, are busy till four in the morning. We're just in a position to try and facilitate that and see as many quality players coming through and, and playing good cricket. Let me just jump in again. And I just remembered that when you're talking about the development of the game in, in, in a country, and you are obviously in the forefront now. Zimbabwe, when they came into the test arena or in international cricket, a lot of people were surprised, but some of us were not because they had an infrastructure, well-established infrastructure, so much so they had 80 full-time, fully paid coaches, fully educated coaches all over Zimbabwe. It was, it was not just by chance they came on, on the scene. They had worked really, really hard and really well at the grassroots as well as their uh, other international commitment. I think there's a lot of talent hunt which happens uh, every year, Andy, right, uh, across the UAE. And I think we get a lot of uh, 
these young promising players, you know, who eventually obviously make it to the UAE national team. So, I mean, how does this talent hunt go about, Andy? I mean, how do you, what, what exposure, you know, players get? With junior players, I think the most important thing is to show them a pathway. If they're really serious about their cricket and they want to potentially play international cricket, you've got to show them the pathway to the national team. And what we've seen over the last four or five years is a lot of youngsters breaking into the national squad. I think Chirag would start it from that generation, but from even from after three or four years, we've got the likes of Ritya, Alishan, a number of players coming through and being involved in the squad. So what's happened is other players have seen that, especially the, the top players have seen these guys into the fold and they think actually we've got a, a real good future or a real good opportunity to go through the system. And that's obviously why Muddy's been brought back is that that national academy system of really, really grooming them at an important age is only going to benefit. And I think we see the similar thing happening in the women's cricket. You've got a lot of you know coming up these days so it's 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 just amazing you know to see how uh, cricket has grown in this region of the world and the the promising cricketers that uh, you know you is able to develop so thank you you know both of you i mean it's a great job you know to get uh, players on board just on that chase so i remember when we first wanted to do women's events <laughs> there was 50 players i remember playing training all together in Sharjah, and we had to try and run a tournament with 50 players <laughs> we opened up we did talent hunts to try and just make three teams and um yeah i mean we blessed us i think what what's what's really helped is um reintroduction to playing international matches and that sort of thing so that's really driving the interest yeah basically i think it's all about the domestic structure you know we've got a good good uh, strong domestic structure so that i think helps you know players to reach a particular platform raz i bet you i bet you came through the system yeah obviously well you both did but i a little bit before your time Chiro. how have you seen a change have you seen sort of improvements or what's different from your time now to yeah, uh, your time from this time yeah yeah i mean it de definitely didn't happen overnight and as you rightly mentioned uh, so before Chirag, uh, I think it was myself and Rohan who came through the circuit, uh, and then there was a, there was a big drought, and then Ch and then Chirag's patch came in. Uh, we had Chirag, and but uh, his uh, his teammates who played the, the Under-19 World Cup, uh, we we lost them to England, to Australia, to India, so we were not able to hold them. But I think slowly, gradually, especially after retaining the ODI status, gaining it for the first time in 2015, uh, you know, introduction of uh, contracts uh, and then again retaining it in 2018 that obviously you know gives you uh, gives any a young any young cricketer a message that you know if you stay here this you can make a career out of it they've, they've seen us having uh, full-time jobs here uh, so there's obviously an encouragement of staying back in UAE or completing their studies here and also playing for the UAE so I think that has happened gradually over the last uh, say eight years since 2014 ish so seven seven eight years and uh, and you know we'll be up for that again in uh, in two year two years time. So I think it hasn't happened overnight. And uh, but uh, yes, right now we we are spoiled for choices when it comes to youngsters, which is great, which we never had in the past. Uh, and I hope we continue to have that in the future because you know they are the uh, barriers of the flags going forward. Yeah, just add to that. I think um, you know the influx of youngsters it really helps because I remember. You know, when I, I when I was 18, and uh, and I was the youngest player, the second youngest player was probably Ahmad. He was 26 or 27. So you know, the age gap was tremendous. I remember going going to New Zealand, and then it was me, Ahmad, and there was someone who's 35. You know, so we are definitely a younger team now. That's also because we're obviously developing from the grassroots level. We are producing our own players, which we you know were not probably doing in the past. So that definitely credits towards the board because they are doing more tournaments, they are finding more talent, there's more academy tournaments, there's more under age group tournaments. I think this is very, very good for the country. Like Madipa said, you know, if the players are coming from the grassroots levels, they'll probably last us and give us many more years. You know, where in the past, you would have players, you know, who would play four or five years, but now you see, you know, Ahmad who's had you know, a career with the UAE national team for so many years. So he's given so much to the country. I would look to do the same for the country. And, you know, we want the younger players, you know, in the system to do the same. We're seeing the same with women's cricket now. You know, live matches now with the involvement of, you know, D10 and D20. We spoke about those things as well. I think it's really good opportunity. People get to watch you. 
and you get to test, test yourselves against the best in the country. But that's the best measure to know exactly where you are as a player. So I think these are the kind of more opportunities you need and uh, you keep testing yourself to get better. Simple as that. But I find it's really refreshing now because the, in the past, UAE would look towards India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, Lanka. look towards the players. By the time those players would come to UAE to qualify, they would be in their 30s and play for, for UAE for a little while. And, you know, it was necessary in those days. But it's tremendous now because you've got so much bench strength. And now those kids are coming through your, your own system. And it, it augurs well for UAE cricket. And, and as you said, they will be around for a very long time. This is why I, I'm hearing two words, structures and pathway. That's brilliant. That, that's music to my ear. And that's what uh, should be done all over. That's what is done all over the world. So UAE is no exception. It's just that now we are able to implement that. Absolutely. I, mean, I think just adding on that, Muddy, we've seen, well, I've personally seen a lot of young cricketers who come back from the UK because of the amount of cricket they could potentially get in the UAE compared to the amount of cricket they may get in the short summer of the UK. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of benefits and a lot of pluses to being able to play here. Um, Maybe there's another change here because in the past, many of you asked the kids in, uh, in the academies, who do you want to play for? And they always just say India, Pakistan, maybe Australia. All of a sudden, I remember in 2016, during the World Cup, if you ask the youngster, what do you want to do? Where do you want to finish up? They will say, I always say, I want to play for UAE. That's a huge change. I think, again, going back to something which we just touched on earlier, great that we have the infrastructure to host, you know, so many, so much cricket and IPL, PSL, Afghanistan plays their home cricket here. And the World Cup's come in here. So, obviously, we have the infrastructure to to host all of that. And after a drought of uh, last year, we, we are blessed with so much cricket and hosting it here. Going back when I was young, so my father used to take me to Sharjah Stadium. That's how I fell in love with cricket. So that is such such a big thing for, for kids growing up here or kids of 16 to 18 at that age so to see so much cricket happening in the UAE. They see, they see this as potential. And as Chirag said, you know, three of the UAE players were uh, were involved in PSL for the first time. And this number is only going to get better by every year. So it's such a huge uh, opportunity for people who stay here, uh, youngsters who come through the circuit, you know, they give their sweat here and, uh, you know, reaps return uh, by playing for UAE. I think definitely we, the country has a lot of talent. We have the infrastructure to do it. And uh, I feel now as well in terms of the coaching staff and, you know, things like that, which we have now, you know, access with, you know, Robin Singh coming in as well. You know, in the past, I think that's changed a lot of things because the way we train, the way we go about it in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of change in that. I think that's why, you know, we're seeing certain results, you know, as a, as a team as well. On the development side, uh, when you're working with the talented players, all over the world, it's very important to get them under one umbrella because of the school holidays. And so it's, it is always better if we can get them in uh, in the school holidays, the college holidays. And we, in uh, UAE, you've got a we are blessed with facilities at the ICC Academy and all over UAE that we can ask these players to come and train with us like it has happened in the, this summer while I've been away. The under-19 boys have been doing the strength and conditioning for the last month and a half or two months. We will continue with that every year. We will have at the ICC Academy, or now it's going to become the UAE National Academy. So we'll have them um, house at the, at the Academy and work with them for two, two and a half months. And I can tell you, it worked wonders with kids. This has happened with Pakistan, with me. In some of the players, you're, in fact, about 90% of the players who are playing for Pakistan now, they are all been through these programs at the National Career Academy in Lahore. So it, it worked wonders. If we give these guys the pathway and the facilities, they will come through. And um, similar things will be organized for the under-13, under-16. Under and I keep repeating pathways, pathways, pathways. Without pathways, you can't achieve anything. And this is where Andy, I think you should be congratulated for what work you've done over the years. A lot of work was being carried out in UAE for the last few years. But actually to provide pathways and work on the pathways, he has started to pay dividends. You can only look at the under-19 boys and some of them who are training with the national squad now. And that is the testament. In terms of the, the under-19 players from here, they, they're doing a, a two-month summer sort of intensive training over July, August. And that is all in preparation for their under-19 World Cup qualifiers. That's a big mark on their calendar. That's a vital event to try and qualify for the World Cup and to, to give them that little boost of exposure internationally to play against the big teams. 
Um, there's also a proposed Asia Cup in October. So it's sort of a key time, three months out now from those events. In terms of how we get to under-19 squads and what the future plans look like, national academy events to engage all the, the growing academies in the region. They play against each other for about a five-month program, under-19, under-16, uh, and potentially an under-13 program this year. And then from there, the best players would get selected and whittled down into uh, an Inter-Emirates team. So they play best versus best in the Inter-Emirates tournament, which would really give us a lot of information on how they're doing and are they translating the academy performances, how they're progressing into Inter-Emirates. And from there, we'd gather them up to the National Academy set up so nobody can give them some proper intense training. There's also, I mean, you can train them so much, but at the end of the, every training uh, um, cycle, they must be exposed to better cricket and, and tougher cricket. And by that, I mean, you know, taking up international fixtures. And we have proposed to Parks and Cricket Board that we could go there in September and play a five-match series. If that comes off, it'd be fantastic for these uh, boys' preparation. It would really, really harden them, and then they can go out there and perform well. I'm sure some of the boys who've shown real talent if they go to Pakistan, they will give them a run for their money. And, and also, uh, one of the, the key things to try and get these under-19 players um, competing at a higher level is also the introduction to our premier domestic events, the D10, D20, D50s, where we mandate that you have to have junior players in your team. So it does give them a, a feel for the game, and they are getting exposed to what the best in the country offer. So... We have seen a number of those players come through and continue to test where they're at because, yeah, they might be the best under 90 players, but actually your step up to international is over here. So it gives them a nice guideline. Where am I? A signpost really in their road to development. Andy, can you shed some light on the uh, Inter-Emirate League activity? Sure. So what we do is we um, we ask the council, so we run four, we've run we got four councils in the region, to select the best players from their region to, to make up their best team. I guess a bit like a provincial or a county system would do. What Emirates Cricket Board do is we also enter it aside from the remainder who's not selected to, into those, those teams just to make sure that there are players getting an opportunity who have performed in academy leagues, etc. Then we play events within the within those setups, so uh, an inter-Emirates, we call it, or inter-provincial, inter-county championship. And we record, we stat, we video all those games to to help aid in a decision to, to try and get the best players out of that to be drawn into the National Academy program. So I guess it's similar to women's events we try and get the best girls to get with the best ladies or women together in teams to compete against each other so we can get the most information we, we can get and then we bring the, the top women to play against the boys um, because we find that it's easier to test women against a higher level because you've got this abundance of, of men's cricket and boys cricket in the region. Just got one question for you uh, with regards to this inter Emirates. Uh, we've seen in the past few years that Dubai probably is one of the strongest team because most of them are a part of the under-19 setups. Uh, most of them are on scholarships with the ICC Academy. They're well equipped uh, as compared to the other academies. Do you? think maybe going forward you could uh, designate the UAE under-19 players to different regions like you did in uh, the D20 or D10 was it when we uh, as UAE we gave two or three players to each of the teams so that you think all the all the teams were balanced out yeah I think what what traditionally happens is Dubai has an abundance of players now um, those players a lot of the time are some of the key national players. But what we what we have said is the, the council has aided, has helped develop these players and made them who they are. So for them to go away and represent another country, another Emirate, we're almost heading into a franchise league, which we don't want to because we want councils to be incentivized to produce the best. What we do say though is because we recognize the abundance for of players in Dubai, we allow the Dubai based players to potentially, if they're not selected for their team, they have to go through the process for, but once they're not selected, they are able to represent other teams. And I guess the safety net for players who potentially aren't getting a look in is the, the ECB Blues team or 
the ECB invitation, we called it. So what was fascinating is the ECB Blues team actually went all the way through and into the final, and those were the players who were potentially overlooked. So it is a great safety net for us to actually say, okay, well, we'll run a team with who we feel are the next best players who haven't been selected. And it's good to show that there is that depth in the country. What we're trying to see is that these other councils come forward and produce their own players and really invest in the youngsters because what ends up happening is they, they have a bit of pride over who they select and who their players are. Andy, what, what do you think? When, when are we going to have uh, the D50? Proposals are being put forward. Obviously, with IPL and everything happening, we still need to find a slot, but it's looking potentially like early September. Still TBC to be confirmed. I think there is definitely big value in 50 over cricket to really test players best on best. All our inter-Emirates events are 50 overs because we really get to see the value in the longer format. There are plans ahead, there are things in the pipeline which would aid the development of, of a player in the longer format. We've got plans to play 50 overs games all the time now. There's no 35 overs game for under 16 even. There will be all 50 overs games. I also would like to do a bit more with the other Emirates or, or before I take them on board, before they go into the tournament, you know, you have camps for two, three weeks, have the coaches, have the players to identify who are the best players and actually prepare them for the tournament. Probably Since some the introduction of these yeah. players could do and help them as well. Uh, I think, because uh, again, you want them to be doing well and they are the future. So it's, it's very... Uh, it's easier to identify a player by by actually looking at the player on on the field rather than looking at the stats at the end of the tournament because someone could get a hundred but that hundred probably won't be as uh, critical against a, a fifty or a sixty in a match winning cause or a chasing cause. So I mean, there's so many other aspects to it. So yeah, I think fifty overs, not just fifty overs, multi-day format is it's such a good thing to have in a system. There are these discussions happening. I know Muddy's been forefront of these as since he's come in. Right, guys. So it's time to wrap up now. And I, I think it was, there was a lot of vital information that was shared. And I think uh, the cricket for UAE really looks bright and promising. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. We'll be back with some more surprises in our next episode. See you all soon. Until then, stay tuned. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Yes.